Okay, so this new topic is a very, very important topic in machine design, uh, in aerospace industry, in mechanical, in, in, in the, um, the car industry, in civil engineering, any place we got two different surfaces. I want you to think about this. I got two surfaces and I want to join them together. Um, there are not many options there, right? The first option could be you, you can put the adhesive tape and you put them together. We do that quite often. Uh, we have bonded joints where you put epoxy and we bond them together. The other, uh, the strongest way to do this, but we pay a penalty price for that, is uh, we can have these joints, we put them together, and then we have a bolt or a fastener, what we call a fastener, that goes through that, okay? And uh, this particular topic, I am going to be uh, also interjecting some of the YouTube videos, I think they explain very well, because night figures, to a better understand what goes on. Uh, it's very important that you pay a very close attention, because once you have two surfaces that are together, you want to make sure they don't get loosened up. Okay, anytime they lose, they lose their, they, if they get loose, then you're gonna lose your entire structure and that can be devastating. Um, basically what you want to do is you wanna have a preload where it clamps up together so that way it will not move. Okay, if it's loose, uh, that any load, whatever, it's like having two surfaces that are loose, if they cannot carry any load, they really don't do much of a job, okay? So let's start our topic. Uh, this is fastener joint stiffness. That's what we talk about. Before we start, this, uh, the, the, I want to share with you the three purposes for main purposes for which your uh, joints are designed. First of all, uh, first, uh, first of them is pure shear. For the case of pure shear, you can... Uh, I always like to do free body diagrams. I think it's important that you understand how the free bodies actually work. Okay, so if you had, uh, and this is your bolt, okay, and uh, you're applying a load here, you're applying a load there. Because of action reaction, change the colors here, so action reaction, you're gonna have a load in this direction, and you're gonna have a load in the opposite direction. And action reaction, so you're gonna have uh, a load in this direction, and you're gonna have a load in the opposite direction. And this has to be action reaction, has to be a load in this direction, a load in this direction, and then you will have a load, it all acts in the same direction and the load is there, okay? So internally they cancel out. This is a shear, a shear joint. And you can see, you can appreciate the joints that are given here. This is the strongest of its case, okay? These are the strongest joints, and whenever possible, you want to make sure that this is, uh, this is the joint that you use. But many cases, that's not possible. So then you have to go through what we call tension joints. Tension joints is your second option. Um, in this particular case, if you just take the bolt, uh, you want to know where the loads are in the bolt, you just divide, you know, if you separate, you're gonna have same amount of load on both sides. Okay, so this is this is your bolt strength. Um, these are very, uh, they're used quite often. Uh, here, if you look at this, this uh, they, these are not acting so much in shear because this is bending, right? This is coming downwards. Then this will actually act in tension. These are meant to act in tension, um, and the rivets in the airplane are also meant to act in tension, okay, so these actually act in tension. Uh, however, this can also be combined in shear many times, so it depends on the type of application and how they are installed. Now, the last case is a case where you, uh, you may have actually a combination of both. If you look at this, you will have a load that's actually applied here. The resultant force can be maybe applied somewhere there, and then this is gonna generate a moment, right? It's generating a moment, you got an axial load. So in this sense, what you really have is, you have a bolt, if I look at this segment right here, 
you will have a bolt that's going to have uh, shear loads and will also have tension loads. It's going to have both. Uh, many times this cannot be avoided, but whenever that is possible, you want to at all costs try to avoid this. Uh, one last thing that you have to keep in mind that you, when you work with nuts, you never want to reuse the nuts. Once you uh, you loosen the nut, you want to replace it. Okay. Uh, and before we move on, let's understand some terminology. First of all, this is what we call a nut. Uh, I'm going to call this, th these are the threads uh, of your fastener. This is a run out. Run out is exactly right here where the shank and the thread begin, in, right in that point right there. The, the shank is the location uh, of your bolt that doesn't have any thread. This radius is a very small radius. You can you can barely see it, but you have a fitted radius. That's done for uh, DADT purposes for T. Um, and then this is your head and the different type of heads, and we have that. So we're going to call this the grip length. We call this the thread length. Um, this is called transition, but for our purposes, we're just going to call this whole thing thread. This is the nominal length. Uh, this is diameter. The diameter is actually uh, given by tables, so you have the information. And I want you to watch this next video because I think it's very, uh, and, and this is from the Flexible Assembly Systems Inc. You can look, for, uh, look at them in um, YouTube. Uh, I like their explanation on how this goes, and I want you to look at it. So let's get started. In this video, we will investigate the strength of a fastener, what torque is, and how it affects tightening. Let's start off by exploring the threaded fastener. Its function is to clamp two or more components together by acting as a heavy spring between the components. Under heavy loads, fasteners start to deform and change shape. They must be able to withstand the forces upon them to avoid failure. The total scope of all the components being clamped together and the fastener is called the bolted joint. The support surface on the fastener which mates to the part that it will be clamping, is called the bearing surface. Preload is the state of a bolt's tensile load, its capacity for being able to withstand being pulled apart, while clamp load is the state of a joint's compressive load, its capacity to withstand loads while being pushed together. Both of these types of loads, although opposite, rely on the structure of the bolt and joint to be strong enough to resist deformation from compression or stretching. Let's take a deeper look into the fastener's strength. Here is a graph where the black line represents fastener strength. Torque, or stress, is represented on the y-axis, while strain is on the x-axis. As stress and strain increase, the fastener will eventually reach a limit and fracture. The yield strength of a fastener is the point of stress which the material it is made from starts to deform permanently. The proof load of the fastener is its usable strength where it will return to its original shape once the load is removed. This is typically 85 to 95 percent of the yield strength. The ultimate tensile strength is where the fastener is pulled to the point of breaking and fracturing. This is where the fastener will fail completely. While a fastener remains in the elastic range, it can deform safely and return to its original shape once the load is removed. However, once it passes into the plastic range, it will remain permanently deformed. Let's review by breaking down tightening into four phases. Phase 1 is rundown, where there is no contact between the fastener or the components being clamped. Phase 2 is drawdown where the joint is seated and there is contact between all the components being clamped. Phase 3 is elastic deformation and clamp load buildup. Clamp load, also called preload, is created when torque is applied and is the primary goal when tightening. Phase 4 is plastic deformation. This is where we hit our yield strength and the fastener begins to deform permanently. All fasteners have a manufacturer's rating for their strength. Making sure you have the right fastener for your job is important to avoid failure. Now, let's examine torque and why we need to measure it when achieving clamp force. First off, what exactly is torque? Simply put, torque is a measure of how much force acting on an object causes that object to rotate on an axis. There are a few components. The first is the pivot point, which is generally in the center of our fastener, acting as an axis. The second is the force that is applied. The third is the moment arm, which is the distance from the pivot point to where the force is actually applied. So torque is a cross product of the magnitude of force and the perpendicular distance from the force to the axis of rotation. The longer the moment arm is, 
the more leverage can be used to result in higher torque. Imagine a door. The hinge is our pivot point. Pushing on the door is our force, and the moment arm is how close we push on the door in relation to the hinges. By pushing on the door right next to the hinges, we don't create much torque. However, if we push with the same force on the edge opposite of the hinges, we create much more torque, easily swinging the door open. A hinge doesn't tighten under this torsional force, but a threaded fastener does, and thus creates bolt tension and a clamping force. How is torque measured? Let's take a closer look. The first point we will examine is labeled O. Terms will be applying force at the applied force vector, the force, moment arm, moment arm would be a higher value. But what do those units of measure mean? To a moment, we need one newton meter of torque. Why measure torque at all when our goal with tightening is to achieve clamp force? Measuring torque is easy to implement and control since we measure it from the fastener that we are applying force to. To measure clamp force would require placing a scale between the mating surfaces, which can't be done while tightening without having to later remove that scale during the final rundown. Measuring torque can be tricky, however, since you have to account for many forms of friction. So one thing I want to highlight here is, uh, <clears throat> as we're doing this, you never want to go to a plastic. Okay, so you never want to have plastic deformation in your bolt. That's just not acceptable, that's not allowed. And how to find that uh, amount of torque that you need in the problem, uh, we will tell that later in the class. I will discuss that, but I want you to watch this next video, it kind of explains. In this video, we will investigate friction factors and how they affect tightening. First, let's look at where all the torque we apply to a fastener goes. As discussed in part one, the goal of tightening is to create clamp load. Clamp load is the force keeping two or more parts from separating from each other. There is one giant factor that prevents all the torque we apply from being translated into clamp force, and that is friction. Friction is the resistance that one surface or object encounters while moving over another. About 90% of the applied torque is spent overcoming friction, split between the thread and bearing surfaces of the bolted joint. Only about 10% of the applied torque in a joint is creating clamp load. There are many friction factors to overcome when fastening, and a few ways to change where the torque goes. The first factor are the tolerances of the parts involved. Bolts and nuts that are manufactured to a tighter tolerance are more likely to fit together smoothly and offer more consistent results than those made under looser standards. The next factor is alignment. When designing a joint, the path the fasteners take should be well aligned and prevent unnecessary rubbing or shearing when fastening the joint. A misaligned joint won't provide a consistent platform for tightening. Another factor is the surface finish on the mating parts. A sanded or polished surface will produce less friction than a brushed or textured surface would. The materials used also have a large impact on friction. Plastics and soft metals are much less rigid than steel or other hardened materials. Materials with lower frictional coefficients will have less resistance to each other and consume less torque. The type of lubricant and the amount used can also help alleviate friction that builds up between threads while tightening, if any lubrication is used at all. Special fastener types, such as thread forming fasteners or nylon insert lock nuts, can introduce unique frictional factors that don't exist in standard fasteners. Other materials within the bolted joint, such as gaskets or soft objects, will exert their own resistance to being compressed. When designing a joint, all of these factors should be taken into consideration. Today, we are going to investigate why joints become loose after tightening. Loose bolts can result in major mechanical failures and personal injury. For a bolted joint to function properly, it must maintain a constant clamp load. Threaded fasteners are convenient to use since they can be reworked and reused, however they are prone to self-loosening over time when subjected to certain types of vibration. In 1969, German engineer Gerhard Juncker wrote a paper which detailed how he discovered that transverse vibration was far more severe than dynamic axial loads when it came to self-loosening fasteners. Repeated transverse movements which have a greater force than the frictional force created by clamp load will completely loosen a fastener. This research came about when he invented the Junker test, which mechanically measures when a bolt loses its preload during transverse movement cycles. Here is a representation of how the Junker test works. The fixture consists of an upper and lower plate which are clamped together using a fastener, which generates axial load. 
This axial load, or clamp load, is measured by two load cells at the bottom of the fixture. When the rotating cam turns on, it begins to vibrate the top sliding plate perpendicular to the axial load. As the fastener begins to loosen, the clamp load is actively measured by the load cells which provide valuable data for analysis of the bolted assembly. Fastener securing elements, such as spring washers and prevailing torque nuts, may increase friction within the joint, but they don't stand up well to the transverse vibration. One of the more modern solutions is to use a special set of locking washers that retain their clamp load after a small settling period. The disadvantage is that they leave permanent indents in your fastener and material. Other solutions such as adhesives and safety wire can prevent self-loosening, but they remove the ability to easily rework the joint. All these points should be taken into consideration by engineers when designing a bolted joint. So when we are designing something, what you have to keep in mind is that we really want to go to want to keep the joints together. And this is every data that we have is highly based on uh, test data. This is test data. There's a bunch of testing that takes place, each one of different joints that you have. Uh, and then um, you got two different cases. You have shear joints, you have tension jo tensile joints, as I just mentioned. Let's list, look at this last video that's going to talk a little bit about the tensile joint and how do we do the analysis. When picking a fastener, there are two important mechanical properties you should be aware of. It's tensile strength and it's shear strength. We will focus on tensile strength for this video. The ultimate tensile strength of a threaded fastener is the amount of stress it can support along its axis before failing completely. Its yield strength is the amount of stress it can support before permanent deformation. Tensile strength relies on the material the fastener is made from and is measured in megapascal or pounds per square inch. The tensile stress area for a threaded fastener is the weakest point of the bolt. It is calculated using the nominal bolt diameter, the amount of engaged threads, and their pitch. It is measured in millimeters squared or inches squared. The finer the thread, the larger the stress area becomes. When stress, tension, or load is applied to a fastener, it will strain, stretch, or elongate like a spring. If the fastener returns to its original shape, then its deformation was elastic. Any deformation beyond its yield point will be permanent. All fasteners have a proof load assigned to them, which is typically around 90% of the yield point. It's recommended that your clamp load is 75% of the proof load of your fastener. This way, you can safely use a fastener without it permanently deforming. Beyond the yield point, the fastener enters the plastic deformation range. At peak stress and strain is the ultimate tensile strength. And beyond that, complete failure when the fastener fractures. The more ductile a material is, the more it can deform before fracturing. Materials with low ductility will be brittle and fracture without stretching. Many classification codes are available for steel fasteners from a variety of societies and contain the specifications needed to attain a certain grade. For example, an ASTM F3125 is a heavy hex structural bolt made of alloy steel with a proof load of 85,000 psi, yield strength of 92,000 psi, and a tensile strength of 120,000 psi. Knowing the properties of your assemblies are important for picking the right fasteners for the job. So let's summarize a few things here, right? Now you can go back to your handout. Um, first of all, a uh, couple uh, items I just want to highlight. Uh, it's important that you understand the importance of the pre uh, proof load. We always want to design for this, okay? In this course, um, we're going to use, if you don't have the proof load available from tables 8.9 and 8.10, then you will take the proof load as 0.85, the uh, tensile yield strength. Uh, and all the fastener database is given by tables 8.1, 8.2. The English unit, and uh, in, for English units, uh, you use table 8.9, 8.10, and for metric units, you use table 8.11. So the ultimate, the yield, and the uh, uh, Pre-low strength. We will talk about this in in a couple slides. This is the this has to do with the pre-torque um, uh, preload. Okay, so this is pre-torque. So you you initially apply a torque to your uh, to your screw to make sure they stays in place. A bolt, sorry. 
Okay, so if you look at your tables here, 8.9, you will see that you had the minimum proof strength. This is SP. It has the tensile strength. Uh, when it says tensile strength, this it refers to ultimate tensile. When it says yield strength, it refers to uh, YT. Okay, and you can see the grade. You can see uh, these markers here are important. They tell you what type of grade uh, they are. Um, so as for an example, is grade one doesn't have any marks. So you can see when it has grade five, uh, how the marks go. So by just looking at the head, you can easily tell what type of grade system grade you're working with. Um, table 8.10, again, this is uh, proof strength. This is ult uh, ultimate tensile. This is uh, uh, yield strength. And you can see this is a different series and usually have these marks here as, as given. Uh, in 11, this is the same thing, uh, SP, uh, ultimate tensile, and then yield tensile. Um, and this metric units usually have a number, so they're actually easier to know what property class they belong to. Okay, so um, now the proof strength, as I told you, this is going to come from the tables, as you can see here, if you remember, if it's a coarse series or the pitch, uh, a fine series, uh, it's going to depend on where you add. I suppose I work in fine series. This is my tensile area. If I'm working with, uh, this is in SI units. Uh, this is uh, unified series or so English units. And you can see this is my tensile area. Okay, so that's what this is going to come from. This is going to come from tables one and two. And then from this table, you will find your proof strength, okay? And if you don't have the proof strength, for some reason that was not available to you, you will always have the yield strength for the material. Then you just take 0.85% of that. That is mainly based on test data. Uh, some people go as low as 0.75. Uh, 0.85 seems to be a right number, right in the middle of the ballpark of what we do. Um, next thing that we want to do is you understand how the preload works. If you uh, pay close attention to, uh, as you saw in the videos, this actually works like if it was a spring. Um, and what you uh, and I want you to think about this for a couple of scenarios that you have here. Um, first, you want to know if you have no load then my bolt is not going to experience anything, okay? There is absolutely no, so F is equal to zero. There's no load applied here. Now I want you to think, I'm going to apply a load here, 100 pounds. I'm going to insert a stop. If I put this stopper, my bolt in, internally, that's what we call preload. Now that stopper will keep it at 100 pounds. I can remove my load. And if I remove my load, because I have the stopper, this stopper ensures that this will stay at 100 pounds. So I don't have to apply this load anymore. I could apply a load at 90 pounds, and this will still experience only 100 because of the stopper. I will have to apply a load that's far greater than, uh, far greater in order to have the stopper to be removed and my bolt to experience higher load. But we don't want this scenario, right? We want to design a preload such that um, it actually holds this. And from the preload, this is the preload I'm talking about. Then above from the preload is when you want to apply something, but you want to have a mechanism where the preload will always remain. Okay? So the couple of things that you can use. How do I calculate the preload? The preload uh, will be calculated by 0.75 of the uh, uh, of the proof load, and just remember that your uh, proof load will be nothing else than uh, SP multiplied by your tensile area. Okay, so this is, uh, and then if it's a permanent connection, a pr connection for which you will not remove, and uh, you're not planning to remove that bolt at all, then that will be a 90% of the proof load. If it's something that you're going to be reusing this bolt, 
then you have to put the 75%. Okay? And then the preload torque that you saw one of the pre previous videos, uh, one of the first videos, uh, is given by this equation. So this is this comes from this equation. Okay, guys, this is in your textbook, by the way. And then uh, this is given by equation 827. And then you go from your tables. Depending on the case scenario you're working with, this is the K that you will use. If no information is available, K equal to 20 seems to be right. 20% of the preload is okay. Unless you have a table, you can go to another table, you have a chart, or you do testing in which you can find this information. Okay, now uh, this is just how do we find the allowables and how do we find the preload, how do we do all this information, okay? And as you know that this is important because you need to tell, uh, you, 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 you're going to have to tell the designer how much torque they have to apply to ensure that preload, okay? So this is uh, uh, this is very important. So let's move on. So in this problem now, uh, this table eight twenty uh, eight seven give you all these uh, different quantities, and I just want to cover what they are. Uh, this is the this is a uh, this is one fourth. This is like a washer, and so is this right here. So this is uh, your diameter of the bolt. Um, this you will get this diameter basically from tables eight one and eight two. This is the length of the thread. This is the length of your shank, okay, or unthreaded, but this is also known as the shank. Shank length, threaded length. This is the grip length. This is the length at which we actually engages your structure, where your nut, uh, your, your nut is going to rest on. Okay, this is the washer, and we we'll talk about that in, in a couple of minutes. And then the total th uh, threaded length of your problem is LT. That will be this L. Big L will be the total length of your uh, bolt itself. If you go to table 8.7, this is, I broke down, broke this down in several parts. It's probably a lot easier to understand. So it just tells you what is, uh, what these uh, properties really mean. Okay, so this is L. Uh, if this is the case scenario, then the dimensions are given here, what they will look like. Typically, we want to use bolts that are like this, not that they're fastened all the way, screwed all the way in. This is not very convenient unless they're uh, permanent, okay? If they're meant to be used, you probably want to use something like this. But it's going to depend on application to application. This is a tight fit, which we use a lot, especially in the aerospace industry, and this could be a loose fit. Okay, and, and so if you have certain dimensions, a, and this is how you will actually calculate your L. Uh, we will do an example, it's probably a lot more clear. And then uh, the fastener length, um, you can go to uh, table A17 and, and get a round of, uh, some round of values there. Uh, then L plus H, that would be your big L. That's the approximation what you will use for that. Uh, depending on what figure you use, this is figure A and this is figure B. Um, the total, uh, uh, length, a uh, threaded length. Uh, if my L is less than uh, 6, use this equation. If it's bigger than 6, use this equation. This is by design. We just uh, randomly choose a fastener and just go, go on with it, okay? And this is uh, inch series. This is metric series. Um, then uh, the portion of the uh, thread, this is given by this equation. This comes from your, uh, basically, your textbook. And the fastener stiffness is given by this. Um, and we will talk about this, but basically what this comes from is uh, 1 over B uh, will be 1 over the threaded area plus 1 over uh, your uh, unthreaded area. Okay, so you basically, this is how you find it, but we will we go over that in the next couple of slides, okay? 
So this information just to find the dimensions of your fastener. Um, now the thread stiffness, I want you to pay close attention for this is the foundation of everything we will do. There are many textbooks, there are many different ways of doing it. Every industry may do slightly different, but this method is widely used. Actually, NASA also has one of these approved methods, the one that Shigley discusses here. And uh, basically, you're going to call this portion of the bolt, call this having a stiffener. It has this stiffener, uh, uh, so it has this spring. Think there's a spring in series, right? So uh, this is KT, this is KD, okay? And this is all in parallel with these other surfaces. So this is KM1, this is KM2, you can have more than one. So what you can see on this side, if you if if you would, what happens on your bolt, the total uh, what happens in the bolt side is actually when you're in series, um, you you take the inverse, the inverse stiffness, you add the inverse of that, and from here you can find a KB by taking the inverse of all this. Okay, on this side it's the same thing. And I'm going to write it here. Uh, your total KM will come from 1 over KM, uh, 1 over KM1, plus 1 over KM2, okay? And then you can take the inverse, you can find your M, okay? Um, so once I have my KB, my KM, now I have two springs in parallel, okay? KB, KM. And that's actually going to give you an equivalent spring. And that equivalent spring will be KB plus KM. Okay? So this is kind of how we work these problems. Um, but we will do a couple examples. We will do an example. It's probably a lot more clear as we move along. The question would be, how do I find these guys, right? How do I find this? Uh, so I need to know how do I find this, how do I find this, this, and this. So then I can do my mathematics again, and I can find my total stiffness of my structure. Okay, so if I did that, the first, the threaded portion is given by this equation. Uh, just remember that your AT is going to come from uh, table A1 or A2. And then E is your material property. Uh, LT is going to come from this table. Um, a7, so LT comes from a, uh, table A7, uh, okay, and then this over here, uh, this is the diameter of your bolt, uh, the unthreaded portion of it, and how do you calculate that? Uh, that's basically, is very easy, you take this, the auto diameter squared divided by 4, this also comes from the same table, and if I just did the whole thing, then you find your KB is equal to this, okay? It springs in parallel. Now as we move on, uh, I want to know what to find my KM now, right? Uh, we're going to use the first row method that your book discusses. And basically the idea is I can have a complete uh, structure, right? And uh, it was proposed that as you are tightening this up, your effective stress has the shape, has a shape of a triangle in the side or a trapezoid, if you would. And what's recommended is that you have alpha alpha is on both sides. So you typically, you know your alpha is about 30 degrees. And then you have EI of each one of these materials. You have your 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 th your uh, the length of each one of those members the dimensions of, of this, of the diameter, so that is D, and DI will be the smallest distance between this distance, smallest of this, and this. So you just choose the sm smallest of this, that will be your DI. 
that once you have that, you can find the stiffness of your structure. Okay, and you find all these stiffnesses, then you use this to actually take the inverse. Um, once that is done and you have everything, what I really care for at the end of the day is to find the joint stiffness, okay? Uh, stiffness constant. If there is no preload at all, then your stiffness constant is equal to one. Joint stiffness constant is typically a number between zero and one when it's preloaded. Anything above one means that this is not an acceptable joint. And your textbook actually d discusses uh, some typical values are given there, especially in table A12. Uh, this is mainly for steel members using this type of nut. Uh, if it's not using that nut, if it's not using the, it's not a steel member, it's not quite, it's, it's, that doesn't meet this criteria, then you cannot use this table. Okay, this table is only specifically for this type of problems. So this concludes the introduction to uh, theory of faster joints. Next, we will do an example.